I have served in many capacities and many hats, and each one of them has been very informative in terms of public policy, and I'd like to touch on some of them. Heroin addiction, fortunately, has not touched my family, but it has touched me personally through stories, through reports, through statistics, at many, many levels. The other day, there was a young man who is in a community college who is in my office part-time, helping me archive a lot of my research for um, the Women in Archives and Medicine at Harvard. And he came in one day very sadly, and I said, what's wrong, Josh? And he said, my very good friend from high school was also in community college, overdosed, and died this weekend. <clears throat> a few years ago, I met a father who was so desperate to get his son off opioid addiction that he quit his very good job in Texas to drive up north anywhere north, away from the environment and the culture that his son was in, involved in. And his son had a car and they both agreed to meet at a certain gas station in northern Texas so that they would continue their journey. The son never showed up because on the way he stopped to say goodbye to his friends. They handed him a few prescription opioids and he died of an overdose right there. There are too many stories. It's unacceptable. Our society has to put an end to, to this. And there are many, many approaches that we can collectively, professionally, in terms of family and culture, to reverse the trends and begin to grapple with and, and also conquer this problem. As a typical academic, you'll have to forgive me because I always start with a summary of what I'm going to talk about. What is prescription drug abuse? How big is the problem on a national scale? What drives it? What are the adverse consequences? And what are some of the solutions? So let's begin with what is it? It's the use of medications prescribed for medical conditions by a patient who self-escalates the dose, who just keeps taking more and more. He takes it more often and differently from the prescription, uses it for psychoactive purposes to get high or for other purposes, and by a non-patient because the prescription is diverted to others with unregulated doses and frequency for the same reasons to counter anxiety and sleep and improved learning and what have you, but primarily to get high. The problem is huge. In terms of um, misuse of opioids, it's number two. This has got displaced in the transfer to this new um, uh, to PowerPoint uh, 10. Uh, but it's number two next to marijuana compared with marijuana in terms of frequency of use. What drives it? Access, the individual, and the drug effects of all. So what are some of the issues regarding the driving? First of all, the emergency department visits involving non-medical use of narcotics. We can see that hydromorphone, which is um, not very widely used fentanyl, morphine, methadone, hydrocodone, which is Vicodin, oxycodone derivatives, which are oxycontin. There, there a number of emergency department visits have doubled in, 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 in just four years. Why has this been so? The previous speaker alluded to the fact that every person over 18 can get uh, a 30-day dose of with regard to the number of prescriptions in our country. <coughs> Let me put it quantitatively. There are 9 billion pills, opioids, 9 billion prescribed every year in our country. And the reason that they're prescribed and the reason this has become such an escalating problem is because there were a few reports in the medical journals, very 
very reputable ones in the late 1990s saying that these drugs could be used for chronic pain. Up until that time, physicians were terrified of opioids and they would administer them for acute pain, for post-surgical pain, for tooth extractions, for cancer pain, terminal, dreadful pain that the people have, especially with regard to bone pain. And then these reports came out saying it's okay to prescribe these drugs for chronic pain that other drugs don't really um, suffice. They don't really work. And so what we saw is this tremendous escalation of sales of opioids, starting literally with the publication of these papers around 1999, 2000, and this keeps going up and up and up, and we've also seen a concomitant escalation in the number of deaths in the blue line. And so we have to begin to look at the whole issue of is, are these valid prescribing practices for pain, and we can get into that in a few moments. What drives prescription opioid use? The opioids are available. When I served in the White House, we were concerned that it was internet sales, because you can click on the internet and look for OxyContin or Vicodin or using their generic names of hot hydrocodone and oxycodone, and China, sources from China, from India, would just sell you the pills. And it turned out when we interrogated very carefully, that most pills through the internet were a tiny source of, of access. The major source of access is free from friends and relatives. Now, what does that say to us as, 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 as people, as citizens? It means that we're not guarding our prescriptions. That's what it says. It says that right now we have a solution, a partial solution to the problem by taking care of what's in our medicine cabinet and discarding what we don't need. Of course, there are many other issues involved, and I, we, I, we will hear more of them. But for example, a dentist who prescribes 90 Percocets for a toothache or an extraction is irresponsible because that pain disappears within two days. You probably need 10 of those pills, not 90. And what happens to the other 80? Are they being passed around? Are they being sold on the streets? Are they being stolen from a med medicine cabinet? So the biggest source of the problems are emergency departments, dentists, and a few other types of physicians that deal with heavy opioid doses. These are the sources of these pills. So most people get them free from friends and relatives. Some buy them from friends and relatives, only 15%. Some doctors shop and get them from their doctors and then abuse them. Others, doctors shop and get them from more than one doctor. The drug dealer is a small percentage and other includes stealing, clinics, pharmacies, hospitals, internet, fake prescriptions. But basically, this problem can easily be addressed by vigilance in the home, and by patients looking at their dentist and doctor and saying, don't give me a prescription for 90 pills. I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't use it. So who are the users? The persons who abuse only prescription opioids, the heroin addicts who can't get access to heroin, People who use prescription opioids just to get another type of high, they're not steady users, and pain patients 
who developed an opioid use disorder in the course of legitimate medical treatment. Now, how many of these people develop an addiction? We simply don't know. We've had ranges from 5% to 30% or even higher, and the final numbers are not in. There is, a, it's very difficult to guesstimate this. Who is at risk? People more likely to be male, young, have a prescription history of more opioids than many days of supply, have prescriptions filled at more pharmacies, have greater rates of psychiatric problems, they use more medical and psychiatric services, and they're prescribed a number of medications. There was an overdose case in West Virginia a couple of years, a few years ago, not a couple, and the person had 100 prescriptions for opioids when the EMT showed up because he died of an overdose. And he had gone, because West Virginia is flanked by a number of states, he'd gone from state to state, and nobody checked the prescription drug monitoring program to, to try to identify uh, whether or not this was an abuser. Who is at risk? Anyone who uses opioids for long-term management of pain, anyone who uses heroin, who receives different opioids, on a rotating basis. Anyone who's discharged from the emergency room for opioid overdose or poisoning. Anyone who has a legitimate history of needing a painkiller but also has a substance use disorder. Anyone who's finished a mandatory opioid detoxification or released from prison and is a past abuser. What we are learning, and there is no question because of the data, that people who abuse opioids are far, far more overrepresented amongst people who abuse other drugs. Among the 12 to 17 year olds, if they don't use alcohol, their use of opioids is one tenth that of people who have young kids who abuse alcohol. Binge, not heavy, use but not binge, it goes down and down, but alcohol is clearly a factor. And the, the opioids, we have a shopping list of them that are prescription opioids that are approved, that are scheduled two or three, they're methadone and codone or hydrocodones and hydromorphone. Paradine, morphine, fentanyl, oxycodone, pentazacine, propoxyphene, tramadol, buprenorphine, you name it. There are a lot out there. The root of administration is primarily oral. That's actually helpful to some extent because the faster an opiate gets into the brain, the more addictive it is. So the IV is the most rapid way to enter the brain and inhalation is also extremely rapid. So we are, there is a bit of a, a, a good fortune that most people use, it's hard to call it good fortune. But here's the problem, because these opioids are so effective orally and are chemically designed to be effective orally, you don't have the aversion to using needles as some people do. And that's one of the reasons people don't get into heroin addiction. Because they have an aversion to using needles. And here they have an option which is not only medically clean, pharmaceutically clean, but is active by mouth. So it, 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 it is a problem because we, the protection that individuals have because they're revolted by injecting themselves, that protection is gone with opioids that are active by them. What are the risk factors in terms of patients? Early refills, age at first, 
prescription drug need, the number of prescriptions, the number of pharmacies, dose escalation, but the real big one is non-opioid substance use disorder. People who have a history of abusing alcohol, abusing marijuana, those are the folks that are the most at risk for abusing opioids. The age range we've discussed, and we won't get into it. And this is primarily a Caucasian problem. There are real interesting, intriguing racial differences in terms of what drugs are attracted to, what subpopulation is. And opioid addiction is, is, is prescription opioids is far more prevalent amongst Caucasians than it is amongst other subpopulations. That is not the case for certain drugs such as cocaine. What are some of the consequences? Some of the consequences are really a problem. If a person is cut off from their supply of prescription opioids, either the family has thrown out the, the stash in the medicine cabinet, or they have locked the medicine cabinet, or they start to count the number of pills that they have in the medicine cabinet, some people, and there's a growing problem, are now converting to heroin use. What is the problem with that? It's a dreadful problem. It's equally daunting and equally grave because heroin use almost invariably, but not exclusively, involves intravenous injection, about 85% or so. And heroin use means Dirty, discreet drugs, heroin use can, heroin can be laced with fentanyl or it can be fentanyl, which no matter how much Narcan you have, if you have enough fentanyl, you will die with a needle still in your vein before you even finish injecting because fentanyl is so powerful. So there are so many problems with prescription opioid abuse and ramifications, including escalating use of heroin, which some people think is being driven in part by prior exposure, in part by prior exposure to opioids. The other consequence is, in terms of a substance use disorder, after marijuana, it's prescription opioids. Half the people that are reported in the uh, NISDA survey that came out this September, um, twice as many are addicted to marijuana, but number two is prescription opioids, and cocaine is number three. This was very different a decade ago or two decades ago. Cocaine was uh, much, much uh, uh, higher up on, on, on the pecking order of this morbid and sordid chart. We've already also seen a 270% increase in treatment for opioid addiction in the past decade, to say nothing of this dreadful death rate. This only goes up to 2004, but Len Palauzi at the CDC has data that's much more recent. I just have the data the chart. We're also seeing paternal opioid use before giving birth. We're seeing that the number of births of children in withdrawal from opioids is escalating, and hospital charges are going way up. Another enormous problem. Newborns with neonatal abstinence syndrome are much more likely to have low birth weight, to have complications with breathing, longer hospitalizations, medically complex problems, and very high costs. What are the consequences to medical practice? There are consequences also to how physicians deal with their patients. Practitioners, many, have no training, little or no training in pain management in medical school. They're now becoming terrified of prescribing opioids. 
and terrified of having to manage the consequences. So what is the result? The result is there may be underuse of opioids when it's appropriate. The result is potential failure to monitor, detect, and manage the consequences. What are the solutions? The first solution is education. But the first line of attack, the first line of approach, we talk about teaching this at school, we talk about communities getting together. We know from NISDA data and from other reports that the number one determinant of whether or not young people use drugs is parents. If a parent says, I don't want you to use alcohol, this is not a rite of passage, it endangers you, a child will use at one-fifth the rate. If a parent says, I don't want you to use marijuana, the, and, and explains why, it should not be a police state in a home. It should be, here are the reasons that terrify me or concern me about use. You may get away with it, but you may not. If parents say, I, then they take a strong stand, 5% of their children will use. If they don't, if they don't discuss it or if they approve of it, 35% of those children use marijuana. And we don't have corresponding data with opioids, but I, I am convinced that if it's true for two drugs, it will extrapolate to opioids as well. We need to educate parents, and they need to educate their children, and we need to educate youth and college-age students about the dangers of, of, of using prescription drugs because they are lethal. Opioids are lethal. In an overdose situation, they prevent your brain from controlling your breathing and a person dies of respiratory failure. Of breathing. We need to educate the prescribers on safe use. We need to monitor the prescription drug monitoring programs are growing, they are they can be effective, but they are spotty. They are not being used as effectively as they can be. They are not integrated properly on a national scale. We need to dispose of medications and control them in our own homes. The prescription drug monitoring program is an official, it's a federal, state level. These are the kind of issues that you ought to expect of your representatives at the state level, at the level of, of, of the federal government. But we, as, as, as citizens, can control our own prescription drugs. We can monitor them and we can toss them when we no longer need them. We should count our own pills. I have <coughs> spent countless hours talking to pharmaceutical companies saying, please, please just print on each pill a number on the package, on a blister package, so you see that you've used one, two, three. Prescribe them in blister packages numbered. Then a person can say, wow, I know I've only taken four. There's 10 missing, where did they go? That's not being done. We need enforcement, we need law enforcement, because there are bad actors in this in this field. There are bad actors with regard to physicians, there are bad actors with regard to pharmacies, there are bad actors with regard to people who sell pills. And what you can do is 
dispose according to guidelines, talk to your children, use the community take back programs, and above all, if you know you have a family member who has a substance use problem, seek treatment for them and individual recovery. What others can do, promote tamper proof opioid formulation. Aggressive investigation and prosecution. Urge the pharmacy to do a fraud and abuse screen automatically, including checks of the PM, PDMP data. Urge the pharmacies to validate the registration of prescriber and pharmacist. Urge the pharmacy to get, uh, to get access to vital registries, and so on and so forth. Physicians have a tremendous responsibility in this particular issue because they're the ones who prescribe, and the dentists as well. And they have to adopt universal precautions, screen patients, stratify them in terms of risk, make sure that individualized treatment is periodically assessed. Urine drug testing. Anyone who's prescribed an opioid should have a periodic urine drug test. Pill counts to make sure that they are adhering to the schedule and documentation. I'm not going to go into the universal precautions of pain medicine. The other issue is that every physician in this state, every physician in this country should engage in this expert, which is a public health solution to screen every patient for substance use issues, to, in, to administer brief information for treatment and refer them to appropriate treatment. 95% of the population in our country have a substance use problem, problematic or risky or abuse or addiction. 95% go unrecognized are unaware, do not seek treatment. A front line of attack for this should be through the physician. 21 million people need but do not receive treatment for substance use disorders, and at least twice that number are engaged in risky problematic use. So the core components are to screen people, to intervene, to provide treatment, or to refer. We've heard from um, our, our previous speaker on Narcan. I was on the FDA panel, on the advisory panel, on the debate, the discussion, the heated discussion on what to do about Narcan. And I have made a number of statements on Narcan, which some of which have been accurate, others of which have been completely inaccurate. My foremost philosophical and bottom line is that every human being is precious. Every life is precious. And number one is that we must save them at all costs. And if we find over the years that Narcan will save them, regardless of sources, that will be the, an important step forward because if they live to see another day, they can live to see a day of treatment. The problem with anonymous pharmacy purchases of Narcan is that it is like a patient who has a heart attack in a shopping mall. They have a heart attack, somebody breaks the glass, takes up the paddles, resuscitates them, and then tells them to go home, and that's the end of it. The big problem I see is that people who are not entered into a medical care unit, into a medical service provider with addiction, is a continued risk like a heart attack patient, a continued risk of dying. And that's the thing that we must prevent at all costs. So I still firmly believe that people who are 
opioid addicted to opioids need need to be urged into treatment. And that's so critical because this is a chronic lifelong disease. Some people grow out of it. The people who grow out are usually the ones without psychiatric problems, without personality problems, without social problems, without employment problems. Some people do grow out, but a lot of people don't. And if we do not embrace them, that is a problem. And allow them to remain anonymous. We don't know when the next hit will contain fentanyl or a long-acting drug like methadone or some other drug where Narcan will not reverse the overdose. The other thing we should consider is that we've had many debates on whether or not marijuana is a gateway drug. We hear this over and over. It's not, it is, it's not, it is. But there are enough studies that show that the number of people who engage in opioid use and addiction who have not been smokers, drinkers, and marijuana users is, is low. And with the passage of two bills in the state of Massachusetts that decriminalizes and that promotes marijuana as medicine, we are going to see more and more people who enter the field, enter the realm, the domain of seeking psychoactive substances. So I'm very concerned that the marijuana movement is going to exacerbate it as well. <coughs> so in summary, we've looked at what the abuses, we've looked at the magnitude of the problem, what drives prescription drug abuse, the adverse consequences. And the solutions are within every single person in our society. Parents, educators, law enforcement, physicians, pharmacists, legislators, all of us. We all have to combine our strengths to combat this problem. Thank you.